Okay, so the first question, and like I said, um, or maybe I didn't say, you might not like the questions, and that's just all right. So the first question is, what does it mean to make a poem? You go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see if I get into it. You know, the things that I've been writing, not just lately, but almost through my entire career, I would, and I was, I came up in Detroit and gave all my early readings in Detroit, and we were always rude audiences. It was great, I love hecklers. <laughs> um, and they would always, and this happened a number of times, people would, would actually get up, slam the door, reading my readings, and say, that's not poetry! You know, that's when I began to realize I was on the right track. <laughs> that's not a poem. You sure, Matt? Um, I mean, you know, I was a student of Ken's, and that, I mean, that, um, I think that basic ethos is something that I learned from him. And I was surprised when I went to graduate school that not everybody felt that way. You know, and that not, um, and you know, I write different poems from Ken, but I think that base feeling that a poem should be something that excites you in a new way rather than comforts you because you recognize it as a poem. Mm -hmm. um, I was sort of amazed and astounded that, that, that not everybody shared that. Um, and they were amazed and astounded that I felt that way So too. did they want the poem to comfort them, do you think? Well, I think a lot of people, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people want uh, a poem, or probably, you know, we could extend this to any art form, to reinforce what they think about, you know, to make them feel good. Like, I go to poetry from X or Y. And, um, you know, I just think that's maybe understandable from their point of view, but that can't be how you do it. That seems like a terrible way to set about making it. Capital P poem, that's what people want. Um, no, they, I don't, what do you want people to want? We don't even talk to people. I don't know how we know what they want. <laughs> as perplexing as it may seem to the common man, <laughs> making a poem should be uh, exciting to you. Know, it should surprise you. It should yeah. surprise you. And um, as the maker of it. Otherwise, if you if you know what you're doing as the maker of it, I feel like then you've taken all the wind out of it. What about that um, moment, <laughs> Ken, when you were telling that? Last night at um, Ken and Matthew's reading, they told a story about, was it a colleague who said Brad Pitt, the Brad Pitt story? Yeah, Can you tell that again? Because then you read it and it was in the context of, not to be all Stanley Fish on you, but... These, these little poems with two words, they have a big story, backstory, uh -huh. and you, know, you don't know about it. Uh, one of my students was being interviewed, it was, it was for a program, and she was being interviewed by nameless, and he found out she was a student of mine, and he said, Paul, oh, you're a student of Ken's, Brad Pitt, is that a poem? Now it is. Now it is. <laughs> In your book? Yeah. Does it have just Brad as the title and then Pitt is that's, that's how it goes, Brad is the title and Pitt is the poem. <laughs> situation because, like you said, you're, you were a former student of Ken's, and so, was he your first poetry teacher? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> he was corrupted early. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I absolutely was corrupted early, and I, and I, I couldn't be happier, you know. When I got to Iowa and realized the difference, uh, I was so excited, you know, I just felt, I think they probably thought that I was a, you know, Philistine stoner, but but I felt that you know they so they probably thought oh you know you haven't read uh, uh, I mean the very first weekend James Merrill was coming to read and I had no idea who that was <laughs> Merrill Lynch Merrill Lynch yeah you know? well, exactly I mean Ken wasn't going to tell us we weren't going to read James Merrill in his class um, so I didn't know who James Merrill was and I think people thought like oh, that was cute. But, <laughs> There's a whole world of things that they didn't know about that they were never going to know about. I can learn about James Merrill quickly, which I did. Oh, read some poems. There we go. We'll go to the party with him. 
um, that there was this whole other, not just world of poets and authors, but a way of thinking about poetry that they didn't have access to. So I was corrupted, and I, I, I left. Can I ask like, who, who those early formative poets and influences were that, that sort of pushed you on that? Well, direction? from Ken's class, I thought, you know, because I was 18 years old, so here I am, and I'm in Michigan. So it's a good school, and this, what they tell you is true. <laughs> <laughs> I rely on that. <laughs> so I thought that poetry, be, like, there's old poems, maybe like Wordsworth and stuff, a soiling mass of Tennyson and things, and then everything coalesced at the, with Frank O'Hara, and everything began with Frank O'Hara onwards, which, I mean, it, which it does. <laughs> and, um, so it was sort of, it was that lineage, the New York school. I mean, one of my proud sort of self-proudest moments. I didn't even really understand it at the time, but I went to the old Don Treader when it was on um, South U, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it was my first year in college, and, and I found a Leslie Scalapino book, considering how exaggerated music is. And I bought it, and I love that book. I read that book all the time. I'm so glad I had that book. Why did I know to buy a Leslie Scalapino book? But Ken had, must have mentioned her, you know. Um, so it was that lineage, the New York School, Ted, and Alice, and Ron, and, um, and that's who I thought, that was the canon, you know. I begin my class with, uh, it begins with Williams and uh, Gertrude Stein, and then we just moved right through New York School Beats and Black Mountain, and, and um, people who, then they come visit the class, you know. Allen Ginsberg and Ron Paget and Ann Walden, they, just, they come in and they visit and then they're further corrupt by students. <laughs> and well, then Andre would come in and he would make a pass on one of my students. You know, I'm so soft on them. Great. Um, okay, next question. This is also a big question. What is the role of beauty in a poem? Must be not must mean not be no. Must <laughs> not be mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's you know that old Ars Poetica from um, Archibald English, a poem you know. So I just the meaning it must not just must be. I don't know beauty. Uh, I mean, I don't think poems have to be about flowers and stuff. Oh come on. I like to write. I mean, I like I, I put some flowers in my poems sometimes. Um, but I think I don't know. I guess I think it's beautiful. I, and this all comes from the people that that Ken's talking about, with Williams, who's probably who's my favorite poet. But I think that they like their way of finding beauty. I think is more important to me than what what beautiful things are, because we can all disagree about what's beautiful. Um, but the way of finding beauty in something really tiny, you know, or very mundane. I mean, that's, that's what I think, that's what I love about Williams so much, so I think it's more about that way of finding something beautiful rather than just naming the things that are beautiful or not. I got, but I got asked to, to do this thing a year or two ago to write an essay, I mean, a bunch of poets are writing an essay about that Keats poem, you know, the Grecian iron, the last line, mm -hmm. beauty is truth, truth, beauty, blah, blah, blah. And I just, and all you need to know. <laughs> and I thought, I thought about it for 20 seconds, and then I thought, there's no way I can talk about this. <laughs> but I mean, people have written books about this. I have nothing to say about that. That's just not, that's a slippery slope into a place I don't want to go. This is one of the questions people really hate. This is one? Yeah. I think I did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> I did too. The yeah. guys did awesome. Um, yeah, I think I think last time Oni, yeah, she got kind of up in me about the word beauty, so it was fierce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, She's kind of beautiful. Yeah, she is. Um, how? You edit that part out, right? <laughs> <laughs> she knows how I feel. She does. <laughs> um, uh, so this is the third question: How do sound and vision intersect in your poems? And I guess. What I mean by this is a couple of different things. You know, do you write 
But what comes first, like the sound, or is it a visual happening on the page? It also could be, is there an image? Because this came up, this has come up before in this question. The image precedes everything. And so I'm, I'm just sort of wondering for you just how those two okay. things work when you're making a poem. When I'm, when I, a poem begins for me, I really think so. I can be, it's with a rhythm. I'll, I'll be walking down the street and there will be the rhythm around me. And I, I really try to be conscious of contemporary rhythm. And it's not, you know, I've been brainwashed. I, I was a student of W.D. Snyder, I was at Wayne. I was brainwashed into it, you know. I, I had all that background in poetics. And, um, and for me, I wanted to have a contemporary sound. So as short as my poems are, actually, they, they have a rhythmic structure. And um, it's not the dum to dum to dum it's what I hear, and I, I like to capture that rhythm of speech and speed and urban clash, and that's what goes into my little short poems. So it does become a rhythm for me. I think sometimes I want to try to describe something that I've seen. And I do that sometimes, but I think most of the time it's the same as what Ken said, because I think it's about the feeling something coming, you know, like the feeling like a rhythm is coming, like a phrase that starts to start coming out. And I think that's, I think that has to be the most important thing because you can, you can, you know, it doesn't matter what you write about. Uh, we've, we've all, we know that from classes and, and, and bad poems too, that a poem about World War II, the Holocaust, someone's death, it doesn't matter, it can be terrible, you know, it, and once we realize that, we have to realize then it, the subject matter is, is the last thing that you worry about. It really has to be about how you say it, the style. It's only about the style. Which is one of the things I love the Williams. So just putting out there, just saying subject matter is irrelevant, it's how you say the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that ultimately has to be it. But I do find myself sometimes, you know, seeing a tree or something in, or, you know, in the light and thinking, oh, it would be so great if I was the kind of poet who could really describe that. And I try sometimes. But I think mostly it would be more about that one if I were to say something. Lately, I've been working with uh, a, a drummer here this year, um, Mike Gould, who uh, teaches at the RC and um, music school. And he does really percussions. And, and I'm, we're working together, collaborating. So, uh, you know, I'm a letter press printer, and, but not too much lately. But we go out to the press room and we work on something. And he would record the press, the, the letter press had a certain rhythm to it. And you know, then I started thinking, I, I'd like to write to that rhythm. And so I have been. We were working on poems, music, um, visual printing. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a multimedia extravaganza. Okay. When it falls together, wow. It's going to just be lost. Shifting gears. What was the first poem you ever wrote, and what were the circumstances? You take that. I, have to I remember it, it was a haiku that I wrote in seventh grade in Norman, Oklahoma, and to to my great shame, although maybe we could turn this around and, and then it's sort of a willingly way to say that it's about it was a celebration of specificity. The main thrust of the poem was that I, I, I don't know if enough of you are old enough to remember these, but OP shorts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were, they were um, corduroy, mm -hmm. and they were, the, they were all the rage. And, and we didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't keep up with the, <laughs> all the trends. Like, I never got to have a polo shirt. And I really yeah, that's what's by Edie. Oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, that was just awesome. But, but OP shorts, my parents broke down and bought me one pair of OP shorts, and I was so proud of them. So happy to have them, and um, wrote my first haiku that I don't. I honestly don't remember the beginning, but I'm assuming it was something like autumn evening. I put on my op shorts and walk in the breeze. <laughs> um, the last two lines are accurate. I just don't remember what the opening was. It probably wasn't autumn. It was probably like spring. I put on my op shorts and walk in the breeze. 
Thank that was you. it. Wow. Excellent. Well, I know I didn't write a poem until I was in college. I know that because I didn't even know there was such a thing as a poem. I really didn't. Um, my background, definitely pretty limited. Uh, Detroit and, um, and poverty and um, no books in the house. It just, I didn't know, how, in high school there was Shakespeare. I didn't know that was poetry. I thought that was drama, you know, poetry. So when I got to college, I took a, I somehow fell into it. W.D. Snodgrass's poetry writing class, and I wrote my first poem because I was in a poetry writing class, and, I was, and of course he wanted us all to write just like him. He wanted us to all be little Snodgrasses, and so I struggled over over a very formal poem, and that was really probably my first attempt. I mean, I just probably read something before, but that's what I remember. Being my first attempt of poetry was in a, in a class. I had to write a poem, like you do. I mean, later on in high school, I wrote poems to impress a girl. Okay. I seem like we're still friends, but it never really, you know, really worked. Um, but I think that's how many of us get yeah. started. She was interested in poetry, and so I was like, me too. Just like Romney, me too. <laughs> and um, so I started being interested in poetry also so that we could talk about it. And I could show her my, you know, show her my poems. So, um, aside from that class time in seventh grade, it was probably, well, it was about ninth grade, I guess, when I started doing that. Um, so we're still friends, we still talk about poetry, but it didn't she quite work. She has stopped doing that, she's a food writer now. Which is a very poetic food writer. Yeah. That is usually the best writer, to get paid. That's it. I don't think I ever did that. What? I don't think I ever did that. It's a good idea, though. Yeah. I mean, it, it works. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, my first poem was about um, fences and how people, like, I'm on one side and I'm on the other. What are you, Robert Frost? <laughs> well, yeah. I did read a lot of poems. <laughs> yeah, oh, something like that. <laughs> what, how old were you? Oh, yeah, like middle school or something. And it was very dark. It was very dark, deep. I felt really... Last year. I felt like... People really needed to get the badness of the situation. <laughs> Tear down the fences. Yeah. yeah, like, check it out. This is horrible. <laughs> Alienation. Um, you are complete, huh? Yeah, not very. I should have been trying to write about poems. But, um, so, uh, this is a question. I'm just going to ask you. I, I don't know if you guys do any translation. It's, it's a it's a question about translation. Um, actual translation of other languages or um, the translation of some experience into language. Um, talk about translation, that's the question. Okay. Um, I have, I, my, the language I took was Russian. And I, you, know, you never can use Russian. In, you can't drop a line in Russian to polite conversation. You can't, you can't put a line of Russian into a poem anyway. You can't do that. And so I never got to you know, use Russian in any, any kind of, I never traveled to Russia. Um, I, uh, but I did translate. I, I, I did translate a number of Russian poems into English. The person I liked most of was Alexander Block. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah, and I, I liked doing those with concrete paintings and you know, real things. And I, that's why I did that. I translated him for a while, but um, you know that's about that's about it. I like following Ron Padgett's stuff. You translate from you translate from languages you don't know. That's great. <laughs> you just look at the poem and say, you know, it sort of looks like right now. It sort of looks like that. And I've done that before. Right. Um, I have a. I did something recently. Actually, I think it's, if I can plug this yeah. live on air, uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be in the next uh, APR. Right. It's um, my parents had a, my father had a friend who was a brilliant geneticist, and one of those old school doctors who you know they used to not just be doctors but knew everything and he loved poetry, and when he, he died and they were going through his office and he had a beautiful book of of Hafez, oh, yeah. the 
Persian poet. And it was just this, the, the design is all the script, um, but it, you know, it just looks beautiful, giant script, and the book was really nice. And so they sent it to me. They thought, oh, you know, Matt will like this. And I got it, and I'm very excited because I love Hafez. I've read a bunch of translations of his. And uh, the book is beautiful, and it has the, the Farsi on one side, and then these English translations on the other. And it was published in Tehran, and I just thought, this is going to be a great book. So I sat down with it. Family had gone to bed, and I sat down on the couch to read it, and the translation was just terrible. I mean, and I don't speak Farsi, so I'm not saying they were not going to learn translations, but they were just awful. You know, it also has to be a good poem. Right. And I knew what Hafez was about, what he was talking about, and these were terrible. And it was all every verb in it, th, you know, runneth and maketh, and it was just... Was it published in the 1800s? No, no, it was, uh, it was in the 20th century, definitely. Um, and it was just making me so mad, so depressed, that kind of without thinking about it, I wrote, I was looking at one, and I was like, that is not what this poem is about. <laughs> and I wrote down, in about eight or ten lines, a super condensed version of what it actually was about, what it was saying, but without trying to poeticize it. And then I kind of liked it. It was like if Williams was Hafez. And then, so then I turned through the book and found ones that I could sort of distill down to these things. And I did about 10 of them. Okay. And I really had a lot of fun. And then I went to bed. And then the next morning, I, had, I couldn't continue. You know? But I got, I got 10 of them. I was going to do the whole book, but I didn't do it. So I was looking at it and I thought, well, I like these poems. I think they're nice poems. Like, that's my poems. But the more I thought about it, I thought, I think these are translations. And there's no, these are, these are translations. It's translations of the content mm -hmm. of the poem. I, mean, I don't speak Farsi, but. Yeah, it's like a distilled. Uh, I would argue that they're more accurate than the ones in the book. Right. Well, my, my Russian teacher at Wayne was Vera Dunham. Vera um, worked with Robert Bly and Jane Kenyon. She was, she was the one who provided the, the prose ponies for them. But she always said that my translations were better because I actually knew Russian, well, not anymore. But she, she, she didn't fight that much. Many, many people, the whole idea is that you're going to write a translation even though you don't know the language. You, make it, you want to make it sing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the American version has got to work. And there are people who want to make accurate translations and they don't sing. They line up page and flat. Mm -hmm. but we take bloody liberty, don't we? Sure. Well, you have to. I think you have to give up the idea that there's actually, a, I mean, there's a relationship, but you have to, mm -hmm. you know, you have to give that up and just say, what I'm doing is sort of different. Right. Well, that's great. Um, Ken, are your translations somewhere where we can read them? Um, um, about about? I think the only place ever one was published was um, Andre Pedreski published one of them in uh, Exquisite Course. Okay. That was the only one that there was one. I did. I have this quite a few of them. Does he? Is it? Is that digitized or anything? I mean, is that online now? It probably is. Yeah, that'd be great because that was such a great magazine. But yeah, it's been on for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they still have they still have a, uh, a digital presence. He, he, he took a bunch of those little poems right last night. He put them. They're on. They're online. He, 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 he was an exquisite corpse. Um, Andre Kudrescu is you know, the editor of Ex Exquisite Corpse and is the one you hear with the Transylvanian accent on um, all things considered. You're riding in your car and what's this <laughs> library or that? Yeah, the voice, the voice coming out. Yeah. He was, he, was um, he came to the U.S. when he was 19 years old and he came to Detroit. He first went to New York for one month and then moved to Detroit. So I met him right away when he was 19 years old. And he was trying to talk about translation. He was trying to trying to write in English right away, and um, and we would all be sitting around someplace. And we'd say, "What's that word? You know that word? What's that word for?" And we we tell the exact opposite. Kuka. <laughs> yeah. Well, then he gets his, he gets published first of all. He's like this great surrealist poet. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he's doing? He has no idea what he's doing. Because you guys. Do. <laughs> That's great. So, um, APR soon coming up? <coughs> Excellent. That's awesome. Um, next question. Talk about frustration. Um, 
A time when you experienced the failure of language. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Your language is failing me right now. Yeah. Um, I think all the time, you know, it's never, the poem is never what you want it to be. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think, I, I guess it would be weird if, if, if that's you, exactly yeah, what I meant. Perfect. I set out to do this and I did it next, you know. <laughs> um, I think there is probably all these frustrations because it's never, you're, you're, it's like a struggle, but I always, I mean, I've, I always think you have to just follow, I know it sounds like one of those mystery writers saying, the characters just tell me what to do, but <laughs> I do think you just have to follow where the poem suggests it's taking you. I think when you fight that, the reader can tell, they can tell that it's being hemmed into like a shape or a box or something. Mm -hmm. And I, what I love most, like when I know when I, uh, let's say when I'm happiest writing is when I feel like I don't know where I'm going and I kind of don't know what I'm saying and that seems really exciting to me. Because um, when you know what you're saying and what's the point of really saying it, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, everyone who reads it is going to feel like, oh, he just told me what he was thinking. <laughs> he, he hates injustice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like the poems that go off in some direction that they are suggesting. So I guess that's maybe frustrating if you feel like you wanted to say something about injustice, but it's more fun too. My frustration comes from my poems are short, but they often are much, much longer. And it's a matter of trying to, in the art, like sometimes they're five lines long. You know, it's out. And, and trying to get that to the, just the minimal amount of words that say what, really say what I want to say. I never do that, but um, it's, it's distilling, it's getting rid of words, getting rid of extra things, getting rid of things that just don't matter, to get down to absolutely bare minimum. And I mean, I know that you probably don't look at my poems and think, you know, that that's my, my literary son. <laughs> but, um, but that's something that I really did get from your poem, you know, that idea that, I mean, because my, I think my style is pretty compressed it, compared to a lot of people out there. Yeah, and I, sure is. And that's what I got from you, that idea that, you know, less is more. Like, we don't need a lot of, of froofiness. We need to try to get to the, to the clearest way to say it. I like the way you do it. I mean, I like the way you, and I can see your poem, you, that you're wandering towards things and you, I just get there. It doesn't matter if you do it. Um, what advice would you give to high school students who want to write poetry? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. <laughs> no. Get a pair of OP shorts. OP. <laughs> Prepare yourself for life and food service. <laughs> <laughs> um, Says, tells them they have to read a lot of things, so maybe that's what I'm supposed to say. Um, it's not bad advice. You should read a lot of things. I, uh, what would you tell them? I didn't write poetry in high school. What would I, what would I be able to tell someone? It doesn't matter. You don't want to write poetry? Bully for you, as Frank O'Hara said. <laughs> yeah. Do something else. But what if they do want to write? Read. I'll go with that. Yeah, because that's one way of discovering the world. You know, you have to read poetry. You have to read some good poetry. And probably, I suggest reading contemporary poetry because that's at least the language you speak. You can go back, and I think you should go back and read the poets of the past. But I think if you're going to, as a beginning writer, I think you should read some contemporary people writing the same language you speak. Because also, I think the thing about young writers is you just don't know. You know, they're always amazed when you show them something and they... Well, that's one of the reasons I like teaching undergrads uh, so much. Um, because you can show them something that absolutely expands their vision of what poetry could be because they didn't think anyone was doing that and they didn't think they could do that. Um, and, I, and I think that's great, but, you know, young, I think young writers often 
they sort of reinvent the wheel a lot because they just have, don't know there's all this stuff that they do. So I think reading, reading quickly, as quickly as you can, a bunch of stuff going on right now gives them a sense of not just maybe what not to do in terms of not reinventing the wheel, but also this great possibility. Like, oh, I can do that. I can do this. That's great. Um, I had this teacher at Iowa, Jim Galvin, who kind of had this sort of funny um, metaphor when people would, because you know, weirdly, even at Iowa, people would sort of push against that idea that you have to read a lot of things. Hmm. And he would say, uh, he's like, yeah, all right, man, but you know, like, you're, what if you're a filmmaker? And you're like, you know, I'm going to be a filmmaker, but I'm not going to watch any movies or anything. I'm just going to like figure out how to work the camera. And then he said, you know what your movie would be? It would be your house, the front door opens, and your parents come out and wave at you. And you're like, all right, I'm in a movie. <laughs> um, because you, who, you wouldn't have any idea about what you could do with the camera, you know, because you would just think, no, it's good, it's good enough to just, I'll just make a movie from my own experience. My yeah. parents, my house, it's great. But that never happened, because uh, filmmakers, uh, they, people like to watch films. Right. People don't want to read poems. Yeah. But they do. They do. You do. Okay, I do. <laughs> well, that reminds me, one time I was talking to somebody, I used to be a dancer, and I was talking to somebody, and they said, Oh, you're a dancer? And I said, yeah. Said, oh, I'm a dancer too. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, what kind of dance do you do? Like, what do you study? What do you do? Oh, no, I don't, I don't really want to take dance from anybody else. It's just the thing that I do, and I do it in my, my own. And that's so, I <laughs> sort of like, I was like, oh, um, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so reading. That's good. Any particular one book that they should read? Or I can... Move on. <laughs> they should all read Mary Ruffel's new book of lectures called Madness, Rack, and Honey. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this new book, but it is, you know, it sounds like, the, it sounds like I'm, at, I'm suggesting they take a big horse pill, you know, ooh, a book, a 400 page book of lectures <laughs> on poetry. But she's crazy in a great way. <clears throat> it is so entertaining. It is so not lectures. And the book also, it spans a few years, and they start out as sort of Lectures you could imagine someone presenting, but possibly getting in trouble for it afterwards. But by the end of the book, it just fragments into these amazing, almost, I mean, they're basically poems. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good advice in it. And it's all about not being square, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the, like, if you could distill it down to, to that. And she got in a lot of trouble, not trouble, but she had trouble. Um, she was saying she had trouble because of of all places, poetry journals wouldn't publish them because they called them anti-intellectual. Oh, yeah, I love that. Idea. And they're, it's a different kind of intellectual. It's not, it's not academic. Um, it's, I mean, she, she references, you know, Lorca's idea of Duende all the time, and all sorts of Chinese poets and all these ideas of, of other ways of, I mean, of other ways of thinking. If you can't publish that kind of work in a poetry journal, then what's going on? Mm -hmm. Um, but she she couldn't get them published because people would say, well, these are anti-intellectual. These don't celebrate the sort of positivistic way of talking about poetry. I haven't read this book. I read it it's just time. out in the last couple of months. It's oh, really? Really good. Wave. 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 Okay. She was just down in North Carolina, Wave. and um, she did a lot of talking about her erasure books, which was really amazing too. Yeah. But she would um, she one time we were talking, and she just you know say, well. I didn't have permission to use this old book that I was erasing, and I felt really bad, so I decided to talk to the person who wrote it, who's dead. Yeah. And she's like, yeah. and they said, you know, they said it was okay. In fact, they actually really liked what I was doing. <laughs> and she said, this is if, like, you know, I just talked to their ghost, and my students were like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was awesome. Their brains were just exploding. Like, <laughs> Well, that's the point that you should read. You should read Alice in that way. Make your brain explode. There's no, there's no, Alice is my, she is probably my absolute favorite, you know, um, right? I mean, li she's living poet. There you go. Living American poet, Alice. Um, she writes in such an intense and bleak way you might not survive the book. <laughs> you know? But if you do, you'll be better for it. Oh, great. That's awesome. Um, so, let me just see about the time we have. Um, Who's your favorite contemporary book? Yeah, we could go on with it. We could make a list. Yeah, we'll go ahead. That's not different. All right, so here's this 
question. Um, the famous line by uh, Ordorno to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric, and then this was countered by Jerome Rothenberg after Auschwitz, there's only poetry. Um, I counter with him. No, you're a mother. <laughs> no, you are. <laughs> um, um, so the question is, is there anything that poetry can't approach? Like, I don't know. That's the question. The bank. The bank. <laughs> but you had that. Did you had across the bank. But I mean literally, like, to get in there and get some money. But you couldn't oh, get back out. Couldn't get back out. <laughs> no, I think that quote is ridiculous. I mean, I think I, I mean, of course we sort of know what he's talking about, but that is, that's such a stupid slippery slope, you know, to say, this is out of bounds now, and then, and then what's next? I just think Jerry would say it again, but I don't think so, I mean, I, I don't think that would be what he would say now. What would he say now? I don't know. <laughs> um, he probably wouldn't say, it, wouldn't say that at all. Would... Are you talking about Jerry, Jerry Rothenberg or yeah. Dorna? Right. Well, I'm Adorno, took, or, or Adorno took, took it back, actually. Adorno, like, oh, yeah. Okay. He did take it back later. Okay. Yeah. He kind of tried to qualify it. And, and Jerry was the quote about there can't be poetry after Auschwitz. No, he said after Auschwitz, there's, after Auschwitz, there's only poetry. That's, well, that's kind of dumb, too. <laughs> uh, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, did, I just want to object to the Adorno quote because I don't yeah. think, I don't think that's how, that's the exact opposite of how art works. But that's kind of like that poetry journalist doing the Mary, in a way. But there's kind of like a no. This isn't okay. But this isn't. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, is there? Do you think there's anything off limits in the poem? I think that. I think maybe for us personally, there are. Like, I'm not going to reveal super private details about my private life. Right. But that's just because I don't want to do that. But I sort of enjoy that. You know, the people's poems. It's you know. called confessional poetry. Yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. Not just to love reading a little bit into the detail, but in live verse. <laughs> just uh, but I mean, do you? I mean, you don't think there's any thing that's in general off the table? I believe there is nothing in general. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's nothing in general. All right, that is, that's true. <laughs> okay. Um. So what is the uh, the future, what, what are you doing in the future with your poetry? Like, what's next? I mean, you sort of talked about it a little bit. This poem's kind of this. But, I mean, what's, just talk about what you're doing next. Well, I'm interested. I still want to know more about what Ken is doing with the musician, because I don't quite, I would just like to know more. Like, I mean, also how, how the printing fits into it. I took you to the press room, so I showed you. But the, the printing fits into it is just a sort of visual, a visual aid. We got these, we got, we're doing a series of ten postcards, and they'll be part of a visual aid. Then there's the recording of the press itself, and then there's some poems I'm writing, some music that he's doing. We probably, we, we don't know what this is going. Stop getting into a poem. We don't quite know where it's going. Uh, we probably will involve some dancers in it. This is a little dance company, and um, it, it's all based around the. the you know, it came from just two words, remember me. Uh, Mike was, I'm not going to go back, I'm not going to go back. Uh, just, it, it seemed somehow, remember me was an important two words. And then from there, we just going to build it, the whole construct around those words. I can't wait to hear the recording of the jazz combo doing your... Hey, you will. I know. And I, and that really is, that, I mean, that pleases me, because that's at least, I have nothing more to do with it. I mean, I wrote the poems. They're doing it all. This is a six-piece jazz band, uh, and, the, and the pianist is a composer, and he, he arranged he arranged things, and Christine uh, Correa is the vocalist, and she's doing the poem. They're going to the studio, and it's going to be recorded. I don't do anything. That's great. Basket of Lori. Her voice, her voice is great. And um, so, little poem. The reason jazz musicians like my poem is because of lots of room for solos. A <laughs> <laughs> tiny little theme that they can do. Um, oh, I'm, you. Um, I don't know, and I think that's good. I, you know, like there was a period recently where I worried that I was using the I too much. In my poem, so I read 
I love the French poet Jean Follin. Uh, you know, he never once in his life used that, this singular pronoun, the personal pronoun in the poem ever. And they're, they're great poems, so I tried to write like that for a long time, just to try to, because I don't know why, I just thought, I can tell you not just to talk about the I, but, and you sort of think, okay, you're right, but at the same time you realize, gosh, all the poems that are really meaningful to me, especially the really ancient ones, like the reason those Sappho poems are still around is because we feel like she's talking to us. You know, we don't feel like Sappho is so great because she, you know, problematized the, like, linguistic, whatever. You, know, <laughs> you think they're great because we feel like she's still talking to us. Mm -hmm. So I tried that and wrote a bunch of poems without me in them. Um, but then I got it. Then, then that seemed just as ridiculous as not. You know, everything becomes ridiculous. That's what I would tell high school students. Everything becomes ridiculous. Um, so now I don't really know what's next. And I, oh, I feel like that's better than having like a little project. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been trying to write some poems. Because that's what, that's what they pay me for. <laughs> <laughs> sea horses are awesome. <laughs> Um, okay, last question. So, I guess I didn't say this last night, but um, I'll say it now. One Pause is named after this 15th century Japanese poet, Iki Sojin. Who I love so much. Um, and his name, the name Iki means once paused. And so, um, we named the series after him because he was a person who, as you know, I guess, completely revolutionized art in Japan. Aesthetics and poetry. Um, do you like the Stephen Burke translations of him? I do not. You don't? Um, because, well, I think that, I mean, mm -hmm. at first I did. At first, because it was sort of the first thing I read. Yeah. Was, but like then I, I actually working, looking at his poems, and Burke takes poems and splits them in half and moves like part two lines are over here, oh, two lines are over I mean, I could show you, and I know exactly where, which poems they come from. Uh, I would like to see that. So, I I, yeah. We could have a nerd date and I could do that. Because I have all the Kidder, I'm working with Kidder Smith, he's a Chinese um, scholar who works in classical Chinese. And so, yeah, we, we figured that out. And also, you know, he's so, I'm going on record saying this, which is dangerous, but he's so limited in his understanding of it, he's really only focusing on um, Stephen. <laughs> um, just the just the sexuality and, and the radical rebelness of him, and there's so much more, and it's so so complicated. I mean, I don't even understand. I mean, he's an enlightened being, so it's sort of like the understanding is I'm limited in my understanding of him. But at the same time, I can understand that there's so much more to his poems. Just reading, you know, all the hunger strike poems. He was really political. He was um, he had this whole concept of for you, which was this idea of wind flow, which is really hard to talk about, um, which gets missed in that mm -hmm. Burke translation. But he mostly did the the Mori poems, the love poems. Yeah. it's not subtle. That's what you're not subtle. Um, but you know that that's more that, and I mean I, I think it's good if it's what gets people to you. So um, definitely it's a doorway. So I'll say that. A gateway. A gateway. Yeah. <laughs> gateway poems. Um, did you like them? I I did when I first read them because that was the first Ikki I read and, and it's not what you expect mm -hmm. from haiku and from a Zen monk or whatever he was. And, yeah, I mean, I did like but because they're brash and they're not sex, I'm getting drunk. Well, they're still stuff. like that. I mean, they have like crazy titles that I won't say <laughs> on the internet. Tell you okay. But um, they, it's, they are, that is there. Um, but they're written in classical Chinese and they're Portland poems. And um, he has also the prose poems, which are the skeletons series that are all in Japanese, which mm -hmm. will be read by everybody. Anyway, I'm just talking. Right, there was a question. There is there actually a question. <laughs> it's the <your> last question. <laughs> it's the last question. Anyway, my point is, in Ikki's time, um, and some people have been offended by this question, um, in Ikki's time, it was if you didn't read poetry and know poetry, and not just, somebody reading an Ikki poem written in classical Chinese, if you could read it, you would also have read all of the whole canon of classical Chinese poetry, so you could get all of the illusions. And so there was almost like an instant understanding. And um, at that time, you weren't really considered human if you didn't read. <laughs> this is people protected um, poetry. But I guess in a, in, a, in a smaller sense, I was wondering, um, 
is there anything that it's a, is it ever possible to have that be the case in America where people are just reading poetry, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do we want that? You know, where it's it's just such a um, a common thing where everybody knows poets like they know maybe reality TV shows or something. Mm -hmm. Anything could happen.
context. But and I mean, I think you're right. It's not going to happen. And yeah. there's not. I don't think. I don't think it's. I mean, you know, I don't think it's poet's fault. I don't think it's poetry. It's poetry. It's poetry. A bad name. Yeah, that's true. Um, I just think people aren't interested for whatever reason. But you know, also, there's not a bookstore in Ireland anymore. Yeah. There's not a bookstore in New York City anymore, basically. Actually, there is one. Well, okay, but on campus. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a larger thing. You know. Right. I mean, that is a big. I mean, I remember being a student, the grad student at Yale, and going to the borders and just sitting in front of the poetry section for hours. Yeah. And yeah. Myself. Sure. I couldn't afford to buy them, but every once in a while I would buy one that I loved and I kept visiting the book. Mm -hmm. And you can't really do that anymore. And it's hard for to tell students, you know, what are they going to do? How are they going to find that? You have to go to the AWP. But um, I don't know. The other way to, to get people is, is to just be mad and look at something, and you can't shut up about it either. So. Well, I don't know. I I have mo I mean I have a lot of poetry friends, mm -hmm. um, but I also have lots of old friends from college who I'm still in touch with, or, or people who are we've met who you know are architects and scientists and stuff. And I sort of feel like we have dinner, and they're always talking about architecture and science and. I always always feel like no one wants to hear about, no one wants to hear about poetry, but I think it's one of our jobs is to is to sort of normalize, well, like to normatize it. I don't know if that's even a word. You know, where you just at dinner you say like, hey, and you, you bring up something about poetry that is you know relevant. Yeah, everyone takes an interest in the floor all of a sudden. Right? Yeah, but uh, I think that that's like you said, it's part of our job is to just be really excited about it. You know, and my friends. Are not stupid, and if there's some, re you know, if I'm not just dropping a poet's name, if it's part of the conversation, and you can say that's like in this poem, mm -hmm. I think that's part of our job. It's just to make it part of the conversation that people have with each other. Yeah, I had this thing happen recently. Well, I'm sure you've read this book, Cloud Atlas, that's coming out as a movie. I'm the only person who has read it. It's okay. a great book. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so I can't shut up about it because I read it, and then what happened was I read it, and then I kind of and I loved it, but then I forgot about it, and then. Somebody, Kate, showed me the trailer, and I, I was like, what? No, they can't make a movie out of that book, because it's crazy. It's like six parts, and I don't know, it has this weird story. And then I saw the trailer, and I freaked out. Like, I had that thing that you have when you're a kid, and you like, like, I don't know, for me it was like Lord of the Rings, I was like so in love with that book. Like, and you, and I, you know, I had that feeling of like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> like I'm running around, running around, running around my house, crying, excited, like read everything I could about it, read the whole New Yorker thing about it, then I like read the whole book again, and then I was in my class, and I was like, oh my god, you guys, you have to watch this preview, <laughs> and I was so excited, and yeah. what's funny is there's one other kid in the class who felt the same way I did, and we were both like, oh my god, oh my god, and then everybody else got really excited, mm -hmm. and then they started saying, you know what I love? And then they started talking about the thing that they love. That's a it's novel and a movie, it's not poetry. What? It's a novel and a movie. Right, but... Not they poetry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but normally it's like, I, I'm feeling that way about a book of poems. Like, I felt like that last night when I was hearing your new poem song. Like, I was like, trying to contain myself. Mm -hmm. so Me too. Really <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's what I think, that's what I mean. Like, we should... We'd not be ashamed to act that, to say that to our non-poet friends, you know, and you know, not even just because we think they'll buy the book, but just so that I just think that's our job is to say we live in we live in this world too, and I get to hear my friend Jack talking about the gene splicing he does, and that's cool, mm -hmm. and maybe there's something that I have to offer also. Yeah, they'll be like, "How are you? How are you doing?" Like, "Wow, I'm really excited." That, you know. yeah. Okay, well, that's a good place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah.